Welcome to The Neuron, I'm Pete Huang. Microsoft is putting Apple on notice as it relates to AI. Today, I'm sharing what I saw at the press and content creator only launch event for their new laptops. Let's go through what they're launching and what it says about the future of computing. It's Tuesday, May 21st, let's dive in. When it comes to computing devices, Microsoft is at the bottom of a hill looking up. I mean, you only need one word to describe the age of modern computing from the late 2000s until today. That word is Apple. No matter what device you're thinking of, a smartphone, a tablet, a laptop, the image that comes to mind is one of the late Steve Jobs. He led Apple to an era of complete and true dominance over the last 15 to 20 years. It was a true show of brilliance. One of the most legendary keynotes in big tech history comes in 2007 at Macworld, which Apple didn't run itself, but Steve Jobs still dropped in every year to give his famous keynotes. Now, 2007 was actually one of the last times that Apple participated in Macworld. Apple actually pulled out of Macworld in 2008, right after this launch event, which eventually led to Macworld dissolving in 2014. Today, when you think about the word smartphone, you think about the Apple iPhone. But back in 2007, you would have actually thought about BlackBerry phones with dozens of keys on a keyboard and a much smaller square screen. And in the second to last Apple keynote at Macworld, Steve Jobs changed all of it. He laid out the vision for what phones should be, a combination of the iPod, a mobile phone, and an internet navigator. And by the way, no keyboard. Now, when Steve Jobs announced this vision, the crowd went absolutely wild. It was a vision that only Apple and only Steve Jobs could come up with. Now for Apple, 2007 was a start of the rest of your life type of moment. After the keynote, Apple's stock price was $2.80. Today, Apple's stock is $191 a share. In that time period, Apple was firing away at BlackBerry, eventually driving them out of phones entirely. And they didn't stop there. Just a few years after launching the iPhone, Apple takes the same approach, that same imaginative thinking, and literally invents the entire tablet category with the iPad in 2010. They transform their laptops, the MacBooks, into premium devices that become the industry benchmark. The entire time that Apple has been chopping away, and as they've been busy reinventing the way that devices work, Microsoft has been playing catch up, and it's never looked too good. In 2010, the Apple iPhone was three years old and was in the middle of clobbering the BlackBerry. In the midst of all this, Microsoft decides to launch the Windows Phone, but it barely even got off the ground. And they gave it five years before deciding in 2015 that enough was enough and shutting down the product. That year, in 2015, the iPhone reached north of 40% of all smartphones in the US and BlackBerry phones had gone extinct. In tablets, after Apple launched the iPad in 2010, Microsoft launched the Microsoft Surface two years later in 2012. Even today, tablets are still dominated by the iPad. Apple controls about 40% of the market, whereas the Microsoft Surface barely covers 2%. Now, laptops, Microsoft launched the Surface laptop in 2017 to go head to head against the MacBook Pro in premium laptops. Here, Microsoft is actually sort of winning, but because of Windows, not because of the Surface laptop. The market is led by Windows laptops made by other laptop makers who pay Microsoft for the Windows license. And lots of this winning comes from work. If you get a laptop from work, you're more likely today to get a Windows than a Mac. It all adds up to this landscape. People generally see Apple as a leader in consumer devices. Their stuff is well-designed, easy to use, seamless. Microsoft stuff screams business, work, productivity, and it kind of feels stuffy as a result. But Microsoft has one advantage that Apple does not have, a $10 billion partnership with the leading AI company in the world, OpenAI. And with that comes exclusive access, an inside view into what's coming. And perhaps this partnership, this access, has a chance to turn Microsoft's misfortune in devices into something greater. Yesterday was day one of Microsoft's build event. It was only available to press and content creators. And I was able to sneak in for a closer look into what was going down in Microsoft headquarters. The headline is that Microsoft is relaunching their laptops as something called Copilot Plus PCs. This is a full-throated embrace of AI as the center of everything that they're building. 
from the software all the way down to the hardware that it runs on. And I have three highlights that I think are really exciting from yesterday's announcements. First up is the big one, which is Copilot. Copilot is now shipping directly in Windows, meaning you don't have to go to a website like chatgpt.com to use the latest stuff in AI. By sitting on your laptop, Copilot is way more convenient to use and way more powerful than the original flavor of ChatGPT. On Microsoft laptops, there's a special Copilot key that you can press that will bring up Copilot. From there, you can chat with it like you talk to ChatGPT. You can drag and drop images into Copilot. And here's the big feature. You can have Copilot watch your screen and you can talk to it about what's on the screen, almost like there's someone who is like a remote support agent helping you with things as you go about your day. Now, if you think that sounds similar to something that OpenAI launched last week, you're absolutely right. OpenAI launched the ChatGPT Mac OS app last week, which pretty much does the exact same thing just for Mac laptops. Both are powered by OpenAI's latest GPT-4 O model, which has that super fast voice model that makes you feel like you really are talking to a human. Second is a feature called Recall. In a nutshell, Recall is an AI that sits on your computer memorizing everything that you've looked at. It can ask Recall to bring up things that you have seen using just natural language. So for example, if you search blue suit, it'll bring up every blue suit that you've seen across any app, including your web browser, your messaging apps, anything that Recall has access to. And then if you specify something like blue suit photo that Brad sent, then it'll filter down to messages that Brad had sent you. So I've heard two reactions to Recall after the keynote today. The first one is about privacy. Obviously having the AI that sees everything that you do is not very far from surveillance if those snapshots make the way to Microsoft or even the government. As a result, Recall is powered entirely using AI models that can fit on your laptop, meaning the models don't have to send your data anywhere. This also means that it's not GPT-4.0 that's doing any of the processing, since GPT-4.0 is a very, very large model and can only run in cloud servers where you would need to send in your data. That limits what might be possible with this feature, though theoretically it shouldn't for most use cases that they're imagining. Which brings me to the second reaction around use cases for recall. The recall concept to many people feels new and interesting and definitely feels like AI magic. But the reality is that it's actually not the first time we have seen this. If you've been testing any new AI apps in the last year or so, you'll probably come across one called Rewind. It was only available on Mac, and it basically does this exact same thing. It would sit on your computer and record everything that you did. And at any point you could rewind to, let's say one hour ago, and it would bring up the exact screen that you were looking at then. And it also had a chat part that was powered by GPT-4, where you can ask for information relating to what you had seen previously, and Rewind would answer. The problem with Rewind is that the use case isn't very clear. I've had Rewind sitting on my laptop for the last year, and I don't think I've pulled it up a single time. It felt like a solution in search of a problem, which is fine because that's how all this experimentation goes, but it didn't feel useful. That might explain why the company behind Rewind has chosen to focus on its other product called Limitless, which is an AI wearable that you can speak into and use AI to track and process all the stuff that has happened. Now, if it's not a problem of use cases, then Recall definitely at least has a problem of behavior change. I couldn't ever think of bringing up Rewind when I had it, when I felt like something was on the tip of my tongue. So we'll have to see if Microsoft has found something in terms of use case and driving behavior change as a result of this particular AI feature. The final app that I thought was interesting was called Co-Creator. When people think about AI image generators these days, they mostly think about apps like Midjourney, which can take forever, sometimes one to two minutes for an image to generate. But the latest research actually has made image generation very, very fast. Plus, it can take multiple forms of input, including a sketch. So instead of just saying, draw me a picture of an island in the middle of an ocean, you can pair that with a blue scribble that represents water, a beige scribble that represents the sand, and combined that with the prompt, the model can generate the final image, and it's fast. It can generate the output in less than half a second. In other words, the scribbling part allows you to control where individual elements should go on the page, while the AI part fills specific detail 
into those spaces. I talked to a few content creators about co-creator and the big win for them is using co-creator in storyboarding their videos. They're often coming up with very specific visual shots. And the way they usually do this is by thinking of a specific scene that they remember from a video or a movie and copying and pasting that scene, noting down some edits. Maybe they change the zoom or the subject description or, or some objects in the shot. After doing this, they try to switch to things like Mid Journey and Dolly 3, these AI image generators that didn't have the scribble part to generate the general image. So that gave you detail, but it didn't give you control. So it felt like they just kind of introduced a different problem into their workflow. Now with co-creator, they feel like they have a more fully fledged option that gives them both. That's a great win. So what does Copilot, Recall, and Co-Creator say about the future of our devices? If I had to put it in one phrase, it would be this. AI becomes the device. Now, back in September, Microsoft's consumer CMO, Yusuf Mehdi, the guy who ran the keynote today, told me that their vision for Copilot was to be the everyday AI companion that unified every AI experience across every app and every device. But in September, the missing piece was that their AI experiences were limited to Microsoft apps. Copilot couldn't help if you were looking at Google Chrome because Copilot couldn't see what was going on. Now it can't. Now because AI is sitting on the device itself, everything that you see, AI can also see if you let it. And that is actually very interesting because today AI can help you understand these things that you see on the screen. And then tomorrow AI can actually help you do those things for you. I've said it before and I'll say it again. This was always the ultimate vision for Siri, for Google Assistant, for Amazon Alexa. The technology wasn't there the first time and now it is. Now, speaking of Siri, this Microsoft event puts a huge spotlight on Apple. Notoriously, Apple hasn't said a single thing about AI in the last one and a half years since ChatGPT, like literally nothing. In their last keynote from 2023, they made very sure not to say the words artificial intelligence. And people have been giving them a long leash. They know that Apple tends to take their time with building in new things. They're the company that gets it right. They're not the ones that get it first. But in recent months, it's become clear that Apple could actually be behind when it comes to AI capabilities. For one, they tried to build their own models that would eventually live on all Apple devices but it seems like those models aren't actually going to be ready for prime time this year. Instead, the media has reported that Apple and OpenAI are very close in reaching a deal to put some form of ChatGPT directly in Apple devices. So let's let the speculation run wild as to what will actually be released at Apple's conference in a few weeks. We know that Siri will be the easy place to look. I'll be looking at just how much Siri can or can't do. If it's just a voice version of ChatGPT, then that's not very fun. But if it can start to tap into all the various Apple apps that it has access to, that starts to get more interesting. Broadly, Microsoft wants AI to be the turning point for all types of laptops in their ecosystem. Now, is this actually enough to get people to change away from MacBooks towards the Microsoft Surface Laptop? I think it's a little bit too early to tell. Now, unless you're the iPhone hunting down the BlackBerry back in the late 2000s, the market just doesn't move that fast. And for me personally, my next purchase decision is a very, very long way out. I just moved to a MacBook last year and I can see myself using it for another three or five years before deciding to switch. In that time, I imagine we're gonna see a lot of changes to what laptops look and feel like. Microsoft's announcements today are a really, really cool move. Again, a full-throated embrace of AI that ought to define the conversation moving forward. This is Pete wrapping up the Neuron for May 21st. I'll see you in a couple days.